value. Value refers to the range of light to dark. One way of obtaining a range of values is to observe light, shadow, and color on an object. Rendering value helps to build volume through light and shadow. Values can be created through blending or hatching with both darker drawing materials such as charcoal or graphite and lighter drawing materials such as white pencils or pastels, or with gray pastels for in-between values. How to develop value in drawing? Use white objects initially. White objects are easiest when learning um, because the local color of the object doesn't get in the way of seeing the light and shadow. Build up a complete range of values, drawn shadows and reflected light. So this happens uh, most often is uh, the people don't have a complete range of values. We're going to be making a value finder, which will help you um, to, and a, to make a complete range. Define the edges of form through a change in value, not by drawing a line. So this is also another major problem is people tend to start with an outline for an underdrawing, which is great, but then they uh, that outline is either so hard they can't get rid of it later on, or they um, keep that outline throughout and do not make changes through value, but leave uh, make those changes through uh, an outline. So you should avoid your an outline. What helps? Squinting often helps to see the values in things. If you wear glasses um, and you're nearsighted, you can take off your glasses a little. That helps. Um, frequently asking yourself if you have the complete range of values in the form. That also helps. Here is an example of what's called chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro refers to the use of light and dark to create the illusion of three-dimensional volume on a flat surface. It's also used to describe artworks which have extreme contrast between light and dark and our eyes are drawn naturally to the light areas. So if you want more drama, you, consider, you can consider this technique in your artwork. Here is an example um, that shows a, a lot of drama and um, extreme use of light and dark. Light source. So a light projected onto an object creates light starks and cast shadows. Your source of light can be the sun, the moon, a light through a window, or artificial light. When several light sources are present, the light and dark tones vary and are less predictable, and there is typically more than one cast shadow. So when we do these drawings initially in um, drawing one, we try to keep it to one light source so that it's simpler in terms of seeing the areas of shade. When an object is exposed to light, it will receive more light from the side closest to the light source. A spherical surface demonstrates this as a relatively even change from light to dark. An angular surface shows sudden contrast of light and dark. So we see this below. You can see that in the sphere, it gradually goes from light to dark, while on a cube, you have the dark side and kind of a medium to light side and a light side. So this side is the lightest, so the lightest, so it's the closest to the light. But this side is also pretty light, so light is probably coming from above left here. And the light on the sphere is probably coming from this side. The six elements of shadow. Highlight, which is the lightest point nearest to the light source. Light or quarter tone, which is the second to lightest area on the object. Half tone, which are middle tones. Core shadow, which is the darkest area on the object. Reflected light, which is light cast back onto the object from another surface. And cast shadow, which is the shadow cast from the object onto a surface. So this example shows you all of these. The highlight, which is the lightest point in the sphere, which is right here. Um, it is not at the edge of the sphere because the sphere is spherical and um, the, this side would fall away from the light. So then we have a lighter quarter tone around that, half tone next to that, a core shadow, which is the darkest area here, reflected light reflecting back from the surface it's sitting on, and a cast shadow below, as well as a light source. The light side and the dark side of objects. Um, this is really simplified, but there's basically a light side and a dark side to things. And if you look for which side is the absolute lightest and which side is the darkest, this can really help you when you shade. Cast shadow. These are cast shadows shown below on these different forms. You can see the light is coming from the right side and the shadow is on the left side, the opposite side. So it says the cast shadow is on the dark side of the object and is being created from the object casting a shadow as it blocks the light. Um, the light and shape of the cast shadow depends on the placement of the light source. Longer shadows are cast from a side light source, as from the sun in late afternoon or early evening, and short cast shadows are cast from overhead, as in noonday sun. The shape of a, cast, a shadow cast 
cast depends on the shape of the object casting it. The axis of the cast shadow. The cast shadow changes direction as the light moves. The lines from the light are similar to one point perspective lines if the light comes from one source. They fall across the object's extremities to create the length and shape of the shadow. So this is really important. You can see down here below how, um, well, that image has been blocked by this thing, but you can see here that the light source is over here and we drew lines from the light source across the edges of this form, you get the extent of the cast shadow. You can see how that changes through these different forms as the light changes. And this is also demonstrating on the image on the left here that um, the closer the light is to the object, the longer, or the uh, short, the, sorry, the um, smaller the area of light on the circular on the sphere would be. So this shows you that this, the axis changes here and the area gets bigger as the light gets further away of the, the light area. Values on spheres from photographs. This is a matte sphere, and I just wanted to point that out because it looks very different from a shiny or glossy sphere, which we'll see next. Note how soft the values are. Look at the cast shadow, how soft the cast shadow is. Here's a shiny sphere, which looks very different. Look how hard edged the cast shadow is. Also look at the hard uh, edges around the highlight. It's not as gradually blended. And also look at this, it's very interesting. It's picking up here reflected light that is dark. It is picking up the cast shadow as well as this uh, area of this table surface over here. So reflected light can be dark. Here is a pretty good example of reflected light picking up uh, color of something that it's sitting on. You can see the reflected light here on the right is picking up the red, while the reflected light on the image on the left is picking up the white. Applying the six elements of shadow to a sphere. This is a demonstration of how you apply the six elements to a sphere. And you can see that there's a highlight, a light, half tone, coarse shadow, cast shadow, and reflected light, as well as a light source. You can apply this as well to other forms. This is an egg, actually. And what this recommends here is drawing very lightly the areas where you are going to shade. Uh, separating the areas out, but you should draw extremely lightly, even lighter than this example, so that you can actually fill these areas in with shade and not have a line. So this can be helpful if you need to separate out the areas. Here's some eggs shaded. This is an example of applying the elements of shadow to forms. You can see here highlights, quarter tones, half tone, Core shadow, reflected light, and cast shadow in this example. And the highlights are going to be the top surfaces closest to the light, and half tones are going to be the surface that's next to the light area. So we should have a quarter or light tones, and then half tones. And then we have core shadows, which you can see here. So this is a half tone a core shadow, and, um, and then you're going to have reflected light in some of these objects that are not being blocked by other things. You can see reflected light right here. And um, a cast shadow with what's called, you can see the core of the cast shadow. The core of the cast shadow is the absolute darkest area of the cast shadow where it is directly under the object. You'll notice that this is often darker than the rest of the cast shadow. Uh, here's an artwork by an artist, Arnaiz Stanley. It says, I scribble with so many techniques, like cross-hatching and scribbling, but basically it just flows through me into the paper. So these are pretty amazing examples of shading. And um, you can even see here that he is not really doing any line drawing. He's just kind of going from top to bottom, which is, is pretty amazing, actually. But look at the range of values. It's incredibly realistic. 
Here's another example. Uh, this is actually from a mural. And uh, it's called Spirit Without Borders by Elmac. And I thought what was interesting about this was, um, and we're about to talk about cross contour lines, um, the use of some, some contour lines in here um, that help define the shading. So this is cross hatching up here. But what's great is that you can even see how the, the hat is shading his face in this work. So the really developed use of shading. Hatching. So we saw a little hatching in the last example. Hatching is a term for creating a variety of tones or values in a drawing by laying down parallel uh, pencil strokes. Cross hatching is when they cross. See this example below where they're crossing the form. Here's an example of a crossed hatch sphere and a cross-hatched value scale. So you can do um, a value scale in cross-hatching as well as in blending. And what I like to do when the sphere is a very hard thing to hatch, I like to think of it as someone's head who is balding maybe a little bit up top and you're gradually drawing what looks like almost hair going down the form, around the form as it would, would follow the contours of the form. And here's some examples, and I wanted to ask you which ones look more natural. This is a cross hatching on top versus a cross hatching on the bottom of these lips. And the bottom ones are much more natural because the hatching follows the curves or contours of the form versus on top where they're used like a grid directly kind of across the form and they're not following the curves. So please try to throw in some curves on curved forms. If your form is flat, you can keep the lines flat. Here's an example from Leonardo da Vinci of some nice hatching. I want you to look at the fur and how the fur is being flicked up here in curves while there's some parallel line hatching that's just straight here along the belly and along the leg. There's some diagonal hatching. Here's another Leonardo da Vinci that shows some also great use in the hair of curved lines and straight lines across the face that are diagonal and parallel. And also note the hatching in the background behind the image. Here is a Van Gogh picture, it's a portrait, using a very stylized form of hatching Notice the background, how it has these patches, it's called patch hatching, actually, and the jacket also has patch hatching. Also notice all the hatches around the hat and in the face. There's even some subtle stippling right here of just dots, and then you can see more patch hatching up here. And then linear hatching that is following the contours of the facial hair. Here's some Michelangelo artwork. And Michelangelo is a real master of hatching. You can see diagonal hatches here, but I wanted to point out that hatches also start to follow the curves and contours within the figure. And the hatches build up in different directions to darken here, you can see, and following curves. Here's a pen and ink example. When you draw on pen and ink, you can't shade except for through lines. So it's an excellent way to develop hatching and cross hatching. This is all done through lines. Here's another uh, cross hatched, here's a cross hatched artwork and you can see that the lines are very much crossing in points and parallel in other places. You can see here how the lines are parallel and then these lines are crossed and developed and overlapped to the point that they become very dark areas in certain areas. There's another cross, cross hatching example and it shows patch hatching in the background similar to Van Gogh but in a completely different style. This person has a style all their own and you can see that patch hatching also used a little bit in the skin here. 
Um, and it's definitely their own style. Here's a cartoon showing some cross hatching and hatching. You can see the lines are very curved, following the curves of this elephant's back along the form. And that is all I have for you on, uh, on value. Thank you.